Good afternoon, everyone, or some folks might be morning. My name is Dion Dobbins, and I am the Senior Director of Research here at Child Care Aware of America, and we're delighted to have you join us here today as we do a member webinar about our new cost of child care report. Um, today's speakers, we have a great lineup for you today. Um, of course, you'll have me, but you'll also be joined by my staff, Jess Tersha, who's our Director of Research, and Christina Haney, who is our data analyst at Child Care Aware of America. We also have Jen Bump, who many of you know. She's our senior advisor at Child Care Aware of America and has been involved a lot with um, the CCRNRs and doing something, doing the Ignite study. We have Lauren Robbins Robertson, who is our digital advocacy manager, and she's going to be talking with us about advocacy and how you can take this information and use it in your community. We've also got some special guests, Melanie Brofin, who's the Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, and Steve Rohde, who is the De Deputy Director of Resource and Referral Services at the Maryland Family Network. And they'll be sharing with us some interesting work that they're doing in their state. So today we're here to give you a sneak peek of the overall report and share some key findings with you. And since you're a member, you'll get a chance to review the embargoed report before the general public. So we're asking for you to look for it in your inboxes before the weekend. We're excited to share with you the 12th edition of our cost of care report. And as you know, we talk more about prices in this report. We talk a lot of, about a lot of things. We see this report as an important opportunity to share with you um, and with the general public about um, 
the families and children that we serve, their concerns and their needs, and the way the public funding systems are set up to serve children, child care workforce issues, and why it's important for us to have quality, accessible, and affordable child care. Um, in general, the, we know that families and single parents are still struggling to afford quality child care and they're looking for solutions. This year's report summarizes the cost and affordability of child care as we usually do and provides an overview of the landscape. And then we also provide some strategies that states and communities are using to help parents afford child care. Um, this year we have a special section about the role that CCRNRs and other statewide systems like CCRNRs play in helping um, and how they're poised to help communities, families, and providers um, access quality, affordable child care. This is really new information and we're really, really excited to share it with you because it's from interviews that many of you participated in last year. This year, we also continue to do some deeper analyses and we're including um, county by county analyses um, of child care costs in 10 states. Each year we try to do a few more and this year we were able to get 10 states to partner with us. And we're introducing some cost case studies with you from some of our member partners. And finally, we'll share some solutions that are happening across the country and some policy recommendations. And we really try to inform, um, use those policy recommendations and be, have them aligned with our um, policy agenda that comes out every year. In general, we know we're at a critical juncture. In a couple of weeks, we'll be heading into the midterm elections, and it's a really important time for us to elevate the role of child care in the child care system. We need um, the new congressmen and congresswomen, media, and parent attention. And it's time for action, time for solutions, and time to really spur on the policy and state change that we're looking for. First of all, did you notice that we changed the title this year? This actually came from a suggestion from one of our members. So in the past, you know, we focused our title on parents and the huge role that they're often made to play in paying for care. In fact, even when you look at the um, National Academy of Science and Engineering and Mathematics report on the financing of childcare systems, it called out the fact that the childcare system relies very heavily on parents. And they, but they suggest that parents should not be and cannot be expected to bear the brunt of the cost of, of childcare. It's just simply not sustainable, and in the end, we all know that public financing is what is needed. So this year, um, we wanted to kind of look at this issue and think about the fact that costs and fees aren't just the things that parents should worry about. It's an issue that we're all part of solving. Um, we use the word U.S., or we use the word us, and um, it's also um, part of the um, word for United States, but we were playing on that word. Um, to say that it takes all of us, in quotes, to solve this problem. The unaffordability of child care is a problem that not only affects families, but businesses and the economy, and it takes all of us to fix it. And it's not just the fact that we're looking um, to fix the cost to parents, but the cost to the system that includes the professional development, the workforce, and CCRNRs, and other systems, and at the state and local level. Um, we'll get into some details with the rest of the research staff in a few minutes, but in general, some of the key takeaways, and you won't be surprised by many of them, but um, we're basically saying that quality, accessible, and affordable child care benefits families, states, communities, businesses, and our country. We know that it's affordable um, based on our analysis, unaffordable based on our analyses in all of the states plus these. Um, we, again, brought out the national average um, calculation, and that cost for child care at the national level when we do our different averages is about $9,000 a year, but I think the actual dollar amount isn't as important as the fact that it's really about 11% of a family's income um, if you're averaging across the country. Um, one of the other things that we're really trying to push and we'll continue to push every year and hopefully we can do more and more is the fact that child care cost and affordability is really best understood when we examine it at the local level. And the deeper we can get into the local level, the more we can understand how we can support and help families and communities. 
Um, and of course, our big message is that child care deserves public investment. And it's for a number of reasons, but we want to make sure that um, Congress is fully funding CCBG and other funding sources. Um, we want to make sure that um, we can further engage CCRNRs and members like you as thought partners and as implementation, implementation vehicles. Um, we want to make sure that whatever comes out of this public investment, it's shifting the burden from parents to all of us and to um, the different systems that can be involved. We really want to make sure that it's not just about um, thinking about cost, but also the availability and the supply of quality care so that we have um, affordable care for all children. And we know that without a um, workforce that's supported and that is sustainable, we can't um, even think about having affordable child care. So we really want public investment to go to build and support the workforce. So as I mentioned, this is our 12th report. And we are now as an organization over 30 years, because I think um, we were founded in 2008. And this is our 12th report. Um, the data we summarize in the report um, is available. All of the full data is in, available in our appendices. And we have tables that include state rankings for affordability by age group, affordability as it compares to a number of different um, household expenses like tuition and mortgage and rent costs as we typically do. Um, and then we also look at child care costs as it, as it um, compares to providers' salary. Um, we have regional case studies this year from Maryland and the D.C. metro area. Um, we have a lot of information about what's happening in Louisiana. We've got some maps from California. And in Vermont, we have a, a really nice um, uh, case study around businesses. Our interactive map has been updated with this year's data, and it's complete with, um, with some really nice print-friendly PDFs that you can take away um, with you when you're trying to do some advocacy work or trying to explain what's happening in the state, in your state. We've updated our parent tip sheet so that it includes new, new links that are associated with our um, consumer education work that we're doing and the new website. Um, the information that we'll be offering helps families seeking high-quality, affordable child care. And it's something that is, um, it's like a one-pager or two-pager, really simple and easy to use and understand by parents. Um, and also, we want you to check out our social media toolkit. Um, and I think it's really helpful. It's got tweets and Facebook posts, Instagram posts, simple email language that you can use to share the report, um, some customizable things. And finally, we'll be releasing a special county level supplement after the holidays this January. Um, it's on Monday. On Monday, I'm sorry. I have my notes say January, but it's actually on Monday. And you can find um, right now, you can when you when we do launch it on Monday, you'll be able to look at also the county level data in the interactive map. Um, and we'll you'll see like some um, high level county level an analysis for some select states and ten states. So I know I'm preaching to the choir when I share this slide, but I think it's critical to set up the point and reiterate that child care not only affects parents, but it affects everyone, especially business in the workforce and in our communities. And we feel like these are points that we always come back to when we're trying to set up the stage, when we're talking to politicians, parents, advocates, everyone. We always kind of come back to these kind of key points. And we want you to think about these points and keep them in your back pocket as well. And you can use our report to help you make the case. Um, as you're probably aware, there are so many states now doing the economic impact studies on child care. And we highlighted some of them in our state in our report. And we actually have people from Maryland and Louisiana who led the way in that work on our call today. Um, we're looking forward to um, a national review on this topic from Ready Nation. And that, I think, is coming out next month. So we know you as our members get it, but we want to share it with everyone else. And I encourage you to read the section in the report about the child care landscape and about the most vulnerable po populations with respect to access, quality, and affordability. Um, this year, as I mentioned, we've had, we have the opportunity to highlight um, state-wide structures like CCRNRs that can support the child care system. And we really make sure we call out the fact that if these structures are fully funded, they can really help 
with some of the solutions needed in this issue. I'm going to turn it over now to Jennifer Bump, who will share with you some of the findings from our Ignite initiative this year. And she's going to highlight how, um, in general, some CCR, CCRNRs are a great vehicle to help parents, communities, and business with child care costs. And I just want to remind you, she's not going to be able to share everything with you, but please check out that part of our report. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Jen Bump. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dion. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, we are so excited to include a new report section that does focus exclusively on the role of CCRNRs in addressing childcare financing and affordability. The goal of this expanded uh, section of the report is to compel policymakers, government administrators, private sector stakeholders to view CCRNRs as a primary thought partner and implementation vehicle to systematically address childcare financing and affordability. The report emphasizes services for families and providers and communities and the synergistic relationship um, that is played when all three of those stakeholders are served by CCRNRs. Um, it's, it's that synergistic approach that provides a unique infrastructure in which innovation and public-private partnerships can be fostered. Um, the intent of this section is really to, to highlight um, how CCRNRs work in that way and the opportunities um, that follow. We highlight CCRNR's historic and inherent relationship with the Federal Child Care and Devel Development Block Grant, our nation's most significant investment in child care, and offer insights into how states and communities can partner with CCRNRs to more effectively address the nation's child care financing crisis. You'll see that the report is infused with extensive data about CCRNR services, as Dion mentioned. Um, the data selected to share is intended to give both a baseline understanding of what CCRNRs do and how they do it, um, but also to emphasize those services that CCRNRs perform which effectively address affordability and financing. Finally, we include uh, several specific recommendations that address the need for targeted public investment in the CCR in infrastructure to achieve maximum Im impact at the local, state, and national levels. Next slide, Dion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Christina, who will share with us um, some of the big pieces, the key findings, and take, tell you a little bit about our methodology. Um, so yes, I'll talk briefly about uh, the methodology that went into the report. Um, every year we, um, we release an annual survey that we use for both our state fact sheets and we also collect cost data at that time. Um, we ask CCRNRs and government agencies that collect data on child care to provide us with the annual cost for um, both center-based and family child care for infants, toddlers, four-year-olds, and then if they have school data such as before and after school programs, part-time summer and full-time summer. And then, um, so we collect that data from, from yourselves, from CCRNRs and in the government agencies. We also supplement it with um, US census data. Um, we look at things like the median household income for married couples with children and for single female householders with children. Um, and so, and then that's what we use in order to calculate the affordability. So we'll take, the annual cost and divide it by the median income for married couples and then also the median income for single parents with children. And that's how we get the percentages that you'll see in the report. And that's how we know, like, for example, that childcare will cost a family 11% or et cetera. Um, if we did not receive um, state back sheet survey data from a state, then we will use the prior year's data and adjust it for inflation. Um, so I mentioned that we collect median income data from the U.S. Census. Um, we also collect um, things like mortgage and rent, like average mortgage and rent data for each state so that we can use that as part of the appendices. 
when we look at when we compare the cost of um, child care to the average annual cost of mortgages or rent in a state. Um, we collect also um, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on um, the child care workforce wages and also on regional household costs. So for things such as transportation and food, um, again, we can use those um, comparisons, or we can use those costs and compare them to the annual cost of care, of child care. Um, and then finally, we look at, um, uh, we collect um, data from the, from the college board about um, college tuition and, and the average in-state tuition so that we can again compare those costs to the cost of child care. Um, in our appendices, you'll see um, things like average state costs, rankings based on those average state costs, um, the affordability for both married couples and for single parents. Um, we also look at costs for those at the 100, who are at the federal poverty level at 150% and at 200% of the poverty level. And we also look at um, how affordable child care is for those who actually work in the child care field. So those are just some examples of our appendices. Thanks, Christina. Um, this is Jess Tersh, I'm the Director of Research at CCAOA, and I just wanted to share um, a couple of updates about that national average number that we began calculating for the first time last year. I'm not going to go through the methodologies, but did want to point out a few things about this number for this year. Um, as you'll see, the um, percentages um, for the um, amount of household income that go towards um, the national average cost of child care are a little bit higher than they were last year. And I wanted to take a second to clarify um, what that means for folks, because I'm sure that there will be questions about this as people start reading the report. Um, while this is not necessarily an indication that child care costs are increasing, um, it is a reflection of the data that we were able to collect from states this year. Um, as noted, um, approximately 11% of the median um, income level for married couples across the U.S., um, we're estimating does go to cover the cost of childcare. Um, the, the key takeaway for this national number is that childcare is unaffordable nationwide. Um, we've included one of the tables from this year's report on this slide, um, just to give a little bit um, of a flavor for the variations by age group. Um, as well as by child care setting. We wanted to be able to show folks um, a little bit of the numbers that go into that national average, again, for each of the methodologies that we use, which are um, an average of averages as well as weighted averages. Um, so we wanted to take a second to address that and, again, to just reiterate that that national average is um, an indicator that child care costs are still very unaffordable for families across the country. Um, and so, like we did um, in previous years, um, we will have a, a cost of child care map that will be available on the website in conjunction with the report. And so, um, the map that you see on the slide, um, the colors uh, correspond with the, um, the average, uh, what percentage that a married couple family can spend for infant center-based, or center-based care for infants. And so um, that can range anywhere from 7% to over 12%. And so clicking on a state will take you to um, what you see on the left-hand side of, of the screen, where you'll see um, more robust data on um, things such as infant child care costs in a center as opposed to in a family child care center, and then also the cost for two children, an infant and a four-year-old we calculated those costs as well. Um, toward the bottom of the page, you'll see, again, a comparison between center-based care and family-based care for infants and also for two children. Um, and, and then um, we also look at college costs compared to the cost of infants or care for an infant in a, in a center. So uh, at the very bottom, you'll see a download this data, that green button. And if you click it, you will get a PDF that you see on the right side. Um, so you can this could be helpful for you in your advocacy efforts or just for your own information. Um, a lot of the data that is on the left-hand side will also be on the right-hand side. It's just a little bit more um, 
graphically appealing and user friendly. And so, um, as Dion mentioned, we um, did county level mapping for 10 states this year. And so, if you double click on these states, um, you will see the, um, you can get county data that's similar to the state data that I just talked about. And so, it'll break down costs by county. And then, um, again, as Dion mentioned, this county level supplement will be available on Monday. And um, what it is is basically, we looked at all the different costs for infant care and also for four-year-old care at the center and the and family child care providers. And then we also, um, we calculated affordability based on median income like we did for the state level, but we also compared county level affordability to state level affordability. And so if you see in that pink column, if a number is positive, that means it is, um, that, that it's more expensive at the county level than it is at the state level. And so, um, and, um, We'll do, we do the top five for each type of care, and then on the subsequent pages, you'll see every county and their different affordability rankings. Great. Okay. And so, um, an obvious statement is that childcare is a major household expense if it's costing a lot of, in terms of median income every year. Um, we examine childcare costs versus um, housing. So. We looked at average annual rent payments and also average annual mortgage payments. And we found that center-based child care for two children, so for an infant and a four-year-old, can surpass an average annual mortgage cost in 35 states plus the District of Columbia. And so it's, you know, in these states and in, in D.C., it's more expensive to send your two children to daycare, child care than it is to pay for your annual mortgage. Um, we also found that... Um, we looked at Bureau of Labor Statistics data for all four U.S. regions, the Northeast, the Midwest, the Southeast, and the West. And we found that when we looked at the cost, the annual cost for center-based infant child care, it, out, it outpaced transportation and food costs combined in all four of these regions. And we also found that child care is unaffordable for those who work in the child care field. Um, the median salary for child care workers in 2017 was a little over $22,000, and that breaks down to about $10.72 an hour. Um, and when we looked at child care workers who have to send two children to child care, um, we found that they have to, in every state, they have to pay at least half of their salary to cover the cost for their two children. Um, and a few months ago, in conjunction with the um, Center for the Study of Child Care Employment out of UC Berkeley, we created a video called Why Do Parents Spend So Much But Providers Make So Little? And the goal of this short video is to try to explain to the general public um, why they have to pay so much for child care and yet those who care for their children make so little every year. And so we're, we, I think we've gotten a very positive response from this video and um, I think it really breaks down why it costs so much. Yeah. Um, and just as a, a reminder for folks who haven't seen that video yet, it is, it is available on our website um, through our newsroom, as well as on CCAOA's um, YouTube page. And if anyone needs help finding it, please reach out. We would be very happy to share that with you. So the sum of all of um, those statistics that Christina just shared with us is, of course, as you all already know, child care is unaffordable for all families. Um, and Lauren, um, our advocacy guru for today, is um, going to share a little bit more about all of the ways that you can help get that message out. But I wanted to show um, a couple of graphics that are available um, in this year's report and that you're um, able to share. And again, point you towards um, those customizable graphics that we've made available for the last couple of years. Um, and again, you are able to customize those with key messages, findings, and that specific to your state um, to share out um, a, a little bit easier. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Melanie Bronson, um, who's joining us today um, from Louisiana and who is going to share um, a little bit about um, the work that they've done, um, particularly around their uh, economic impact study um, from, I guess, about a year ago now. Melanie? Thank you. Hi, everybody. And um, thank you to Child Care Aware for all your great work that we on the ground so depend on in our advocacy. Um, 
down here, but um, and I know across the country. Um, our losing ground report, and I may we're titling this gaining ground just because I'd like to think from the advocate perspective, we're gaining ground with the losing ground report. But it was a report that we um, did, as you mentioned, I think it's actually been two years now or a year and a half. Um, it was really part of work that we were doing to try to um, organize and engage um, the business community across our state. We had created an early childhood business roundtable, but found that we were having trouble having the business community get the, as much as they understood the long-term effects in a state like ours that's very red and always seems to be in a financial crisis to get them to prioritize funding early childhood was difficult with the sense that we don't pay for that. It, we weren't paying for that immediately um, to their pocketbook. And so I was struck when I looked around both locally and nationally, um, the lack of data on the effects of childcare breakdowns on the workforce today. In fact, Child Care Aware had a great toolbox on it, but basically I think y'all were looking at the one study we all were looking at from 2005. <laughs> it was very outdated mm -hmm. from Cornell, I think it was. It was just so, that was it. I mean, there's just about nothing on it. So we finally gave up trying to find it and just created it ourselves. In a little study um, that we did at the state level where we hired um, LSU, Louisiana State University, to do a survey of parents of children birth through age four, um, asking questions about the workforce and um, and the effects of childcare issues on working. And it was really cool because I was going to ask just questions like what had been done that one study before about actually missed days and being late to work because those are easier to put a price tag on. And we also had an economist who could put a price tag on it. But my business. Um, uh, members said also ask questions about workforce participation and I am so glad we did because in many ways that's the bigger story so we did find um, and so then as I mentioned we did this survey and then the economist put a price tag on it and we did find that over 40 percent um, of both men and women and that was not different uh, statistically significantly different for us uh, missed work at least once in the previous three months because of childcare breakdowns and similar statistics around being tardy or leaving early. But to me, what was even more interesting was the effect on workforce participation in terms of the percentage, 17% of both men and women reported quitting a job because of childcare breakdowns. 14% um, had turned down a promotion because of childcare breakdowns, 18% had gone from full-time to part-time. And I'll just mention, this: we did not emphasize this in the report because at that time, politically in Louisiana, we didn't want it to become a woman's quote-unquote issue. But the statistics for that are even more incredible when you look at women. So women versus men, 2% of men versus 15% of women reported quitting a job due to child care breakdown. 12% of women versus 2% of men reported turning down a promotion. So, I mean, when you start looking at the effects of these figures, 15% of women versus 3% of men had gone from full-time to part-time. So when you think about a woman's trajectory and all those issues, women's issues, it really is pretty stunning the effect of this on women's workforce participation, and um, climbing up the, the ladder for women. Um, so anyway, we did this report and I was stunned um, by how quickly it took fire nationally and was noticed. Um, the US Chamber just a few months later put out their report on the importance of childcare for the workforce and they quoted our report. And then Marilyn, which is on the phone today and will give you their version of this report, quickly followed suit and did it. Georgia will be coming out with their version of this at the end of this month. And as was mentioned, next month, Ready Nation has now done this at the national level, and they'll be releasing their report at the national level next in November at their meeting. They did birth to two, so they were really focused on the infant toddler piece. But, um, but to me, it is wonderful and very exciting that we're finally shining a light on this. It has been incredibly effective in my state in terms of chambers 
adding this to their um, education platforms. Our, the, our state um, affiliate of the U.S. Chamber has now made early childhood education a top priority. Not to say they, I mean, the U.S. Chamber, it is, wasn't the only reason they have, but whenever they talk about it, this issue, they talk about it quoting this report. And in fact, the media has picked up on it to where they really, they rarely talk about early childhood education without, they often don't say it, this report, but they're quoting the data from this report just anytime they discuss child care assistance, which we are pushing very hard to increase the child care assistance, the number of slots in that. I forgot to mention that we put a price tag on it, which was very compelling as well, so that we found that there was a loss, an annual loss to our employers of $816 million a year because of child care breakdowns and over a billion dollar loss to just the Louisiana economy. So those figures also um, were very compelling for the media and for, for businesses. So, so that's been our work around that report. Y'all had also asked, I think, for us to, for me to talk a little bit about the cost modeling work that we're doing right now. Um, and I can spend a second on that if you'd like. I didn't know if you had questions or anything about losing ground, um, but you'll hear more from Maryland about that and their work on that. Yeah. Um, well, I can talk about the cost models real quick. We are doing a work with our Department of Education on cost modeling um, the cost of care in Louisiana. Um, and what this is about is our infant toddler rates are very low. We've recently increased our rates for child care by 200, uh, child care subsidies, I'm sorry, for the child care assistance program um, by 250%. They were so low and so bad that we went up 250% and we're still one of the lowest in the country, but at least we got a huge increase. But what we didn't do was make much of a difference between infant toddlers and three and four year olds. So our infant toddlers are only uh, paid a dollar more a day than our three and four year olds. And so this is what we are pushing on. And we engaged our Department of Ed. They were very interested in looking at this and we're working with Louise Doney, of course, who is the, the mother of uh, the, these cost models. We actually are, are changing her cost model, doing it a little differently than she did it, but she's helping us so that we can feel comfortable with it. But we're honing in on the cost of quality care. That to me has been such a missing link that most of us are looking at market rate surveys and of course child care aware, that's what we're going to as the, you know, what we're looking at. But at the end of the day, if all we're funding is low quality, you know, how far are we getting? And we have a system now where all publicly funded child care centers, which is all the ones that are willing to accept child care assistance, have to be part of our rating system. So if we're funding them at a level that won't support the quality that we're demanding, then we're just setting them up for a low rating and basically setting them up for failure. And I think, in fact, that's what we're doing. And so what these cost models are helping us do is show that. And they are, of course, showing that, as you can imagine. Um, and we're only getting data and information from the higher quality centers, the centers that are rated proficient or above in our rating system. The other piece of it is that it's showing some sort of overall things that we, I think we all know, but can inform policy, which is enrollment rates significantly impact, impact the quality, the cost of quality care, and center size significantly impact the cost of care. So that to the extent it's possible that our policies could help with those two issues, um, in the way we fund, then, you know, we know that could be very important. So, so that's our work in Louisiana. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so next, um, we would like to introduce um, Steve Brody. Steve, just a second. I'm going to unmute your line so you can uh, share a little bit about uh, what's going on in Maryland. Steve? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, great. Uh, what's going on in Maryland? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to give a huge shout out to Melanie. Uh, Melanie was very gracious uh, in sharing the information they did in their original study, and we were able to replicate and expand the study in Maryland. 
and it gets people's attention. And as Melanie was talking, I was thinking, you know, it's really interesting that we're doing this kind of work now because when I got into, when I came back to Maryland a, a little over 20 years ago, this was the emphasis for R&Rs where they were making the business case for childcare and they were helping businesses look at childcare options and, and the pendulum seems to have swung. Although fortunately, we also have a lot of information now on what early ch quality early childhood education to pick up on Melanie's theme, what quality education means in the long term and what Melanie and Louisiana's work helps us to do is also to get people what it means in the short term in terms of helping parents go to work, helping parents to be productive, um, and uh, helping employers uh, do what they, they need to do. Melanie, there would uh, there's one other thing I'm not sure if you're aware, I didn't hear you mention it, is Indiana also recently came out with a version of this. Uh, and if you're not aware of it, Melanie, let me know and I can send you the link uh, to this. So um, as, as Melanie indicated, we've also gotten quite a bit of interest uh, with, with this particular approach as well. And it's really sort of reinvigorated how we look at uh, having such information for a public policy outreach. Now, Maryland has uh, what's called child care demographics. We do one for each of the 24 jurisdictions in the state of Maryland. We have 23 counties and Baltimore City. And then we do one for the entire state. So uh, we do this on a broader scale. But what we did was we had the opportunity with Child Care Aware of America this year to look at two jurisdictions that uh, are, uh, if you're not Washington centric, uh, traditionally have been at the heart of, of Maryland uh, policy and politics, and that is Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And uh, what the focus Child Care Aware of America helped bring to this is to look at two adjacent jurisdictions to talk about the similarities and differences between the jurisdictions in terms of population and income, but then also to highlight how uh, there are uh, great distinctions in terms of how much people pay for child care uh, and, and that type of thing. Uh, I want to also add that uh, we're, we're looking to try and do uh, a, a little bit more in terms of the policy work. So one of the things we recently did, and I'm sure other states are being asked to do this as well, since this is coming down from the feds, is to uh, map uh, non-traditional care and where non-traditional care is and where it isn't. Uh, and that's been very interesting. We we did some work for the state on that. We've not heard back from the state in terms of what they're they're thinking of doing, but it, it's gotten us involved in conversations that, again, historically we've been involved in but given that there's been a changeover in the leadership recently, we, we haven't uh, been involved in. So um, we're, we're very much looking forward to the report coming out for us to get some traction as well as Child Care Aware of America uh, and to, um, to really broaden, uh, again, back to the economic piece of this and the importance of it, uh, parallel that with uh, the approach about what investment in early childhood does both for the short term in terms of child outcomes in school, reduced uh, remediation rates, uh, those sorts of things, as well as the very immediate piece in terms of um, how it helps parents, how it helps families. Great, thanks so much for joining us, Steve. Thank you. As Steve mentioned, um, we did get to work with um, Maryland Family Network um, on a, a regional examination of the affordability um, of child care across that region. And of course, I <laughs> highlighted the other two um, studies in our slides today. Um, and I'm just going to give you a, just a quick sneak peek at the um, some of the mapping um, that our awesome GIS team um, has done with a couple of other folks as well. Um, here you'll see um, just a, a snapshot of some mapping that we did on um, the uh, county level examination of um, the area surrounding DC, both on the Maryland side as well as the Virginia side. And I will emphasize that this is county level. So keep in mind that, of course, we would expect that if we were able to drill down a little bit deeper to zip codes or neighborhoods, that there would be a lot more dark blue on this map. 
Um, so keep that in mind when you um, check out these case studies. Um, as I mentioned, we worked closely with um, Steve and his team at Maryland Family Network on a Baltimore City and Baltimore County map that um, is in the report as are these snapshots. And we also worked with um, the Child Care Resource Center in California on maps um, on LA and San Bernardino counties. Um, we actually worked closely with their mapping team. They did a number of maps for us, which are available in our report, and they are also linked to our report, so you can check out all of their wonderful work as well. Um, for the DMV map, of course, we got um, information from Maryland Family Network, as well as Child Care of Virginia. And we also included updates um, that Melanie and her, um, her folks in Louisiana were able to help us with, as well as a really interesting case study um, in Vermont. So um, definitely check those out in the report. Um, we've updated um, some of the, the possibilities as far as financing solutions. I'm not gonna go through them now, but of course solutions include um, those economic impact studies that we're really excited to see coming out of states. Um, estimates on the cost, you know, as Melanie talked about, it's really important to understand um, not just what the prices of childcare are, but what the cost of delivering really quality child care is so that we can work on, you know, making sure that the workforce is compensated and supported, um, but that we're also investing in child care. Um, so we reviewed a number of solutions and we did our best to include um, case, like many case studies and snapshots of work that we know is going on. But of course, we also know that there's a lot that we don't know that's going on. So as you read the report, if you know of some of those innovative um, innovative things going on in your community or in your state, we would love to hear about that. Um, we would love to elevate those stories throughout the year and make sure that others are aware of some of the possibilities as they are looking for their own solutions um, to finance quality child care. Um, in addition, we were really excited um, about the report that came out of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, the Transforming the Financing of Early Childhood Education Report. And we thought that there were some really interesting recommendations that we tried to link to some of the solutions in our report. Um, we really felt that this was an opportunity to kind of bolster those solutions and promote them, particularly, um, you know, since those recommendations came from NASM. We thought that that would be a really helpful addition to this year's report. And then finally, we tried to provide recommendations um, in the report that focus both on what needs to be done at the national level with Congress, but also includes what parents and providers and professionals can do in terms of advocacy. So um, they kind of there's a lot of them in the report, but they kind of um, come together in different categories. Of course, of course, we're going to ask for investment in child care. So we want to really talk with um, our lawmakers about investing in crucial funding structures. So that means making sure that we're maintaining strong federal funding for states to fully meet the needs of CCDBG um, and meet the law for CCDBG but also some of the other funding sources that can support child care, including TANF and, and SS, um, social, what is it, social, uh, SS, the SSDBG? Yes, yeah, SSDBG. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we also um, really want to make sure that we consider all the fun, all the different types of funding that are important, so funding for quality, funding for professional development infrastructure, and funding to support this critical um, statewide infrastructure that we highlighted this year, the CCRNRs. Um, we're, we're really in, in concerned about making sure that um, there's funding to support working families. There's um, a word, there's a, an act that is out there about it's called Child Care for Working Families Act that ensures that families pay, um, that earn less than 150% of state median income pay more than 7%, that they don't pay more than 7% of their income. And we want to make sure that there's family-friendly um, um, funding sources um, or, or supports for families. So we are encouraging folks to look at the Family and Medical Insurance Leave Act, which allows parents to spend more time with their children when they're young without sacrificing their career. Um, and seeing that as a way of thinking about childcare. 
um, without having to be part of the system as well. Um, and then finally, like really concerned about student friendly um, funding sources and one that we know needs to be a permanent solution um, and be reauthorized is the Child Care Access Needs Parent and School Readiness School Reauthorization Act, also known as CAMP. We are very concerned about providers and making sure that we prioritize the child care workforce and make sure that not only are um, they paid well enough, but that they can afford child care for their own children. So really thinking about how we can support the educational system for, child, for the workforce, ways to um, support those providers through um, CCRNRs and other structures, that we can, how we can target technical assistance to these providers. Um, we want to make sure that um, both our lawmakers and our communities um, explore innovative models to reduce the high cost of burden um, to child care providers. Um, and then, of course, we want to think about how we can improve the compensation across the country for child care, the child care workforce. And that's, te that's definitely going to take um, public investment. We're very interested in subsidies and so, um, the fact that many children who are eligible cannot are not receiving those subsidies at the state and the local and, and the national level. So we'd like to figure out or advocate for ways to streamline those eligibility standards. One is um, one way of doing that is there's um, the promoting affordable child care for everyone act that will be that that's the main focus of that act. Um, we want to talk about making improvements in child care subsidies that are provided under TANF so that the TANF regulations line up with the 12-month redetermination period that's set up in, in child care development block grants. Um, we're interested in hearing and learning and thinking about how states are reducing barriers to subsidy administration that prevent families from receiving assistance. Um, we're interested in how states are looking at flexible sliding fee assistance and phase-out plans, um, and really concerned about um, families that are in the gap so they don't quite meet the um, eligibility for child care assistance um, and maybe make too much or maybe recently receive um, um, salary increases and they're just in the gap. How do we support those families? As we can see throughout the country, um, it's just very hard for people to support at all income levels. Um, and then finally, we're really concerned about supply. Um, and making sure that there are some that there's um, funding for pilot programs that explore strategies to meet the needs, especially in high rural high rural areas or high poverty areas, or um, with children who are um, children of color and children who are in um, special needs populations to really explore how people across the country are um, looking at gaps in supply and demand and working to support. Um, providers. And then finally, the, um, we're very interested in providing, having funding to provide resources for planning and development, developing um, child care capacity to increase the availability of high quality options for working families. I'm going to turn it now over to our advocacy guru who <laughs> will talk with us about like, so what? What's the next step? Thank you, Deanne. Um, yeah, so our communications and advocacy teams have been working really hard, of, hard at making this report, not just a report, but ways that you can easily take action um, pretty instantly right when the report's released, and then some other ways to use this report as we enter the new year and the new legislative sessions post the uh, 2018 midterms. So if you're not signed up already, we encourage you to join our child care works list and join the National Movement for Quality Affordable Child Care. Um, you will receive action alerts and other updates, and we always include an action um, and an option to share in those emails, and we don't spam you. We send them when an issue is important and when we need your support. And as uh, Child Care Aware members, if you don't already have an action center in your state, we can get you one. So if this report gets you riled up and wanting, wanting you to take action and communicate more directly with your elected officials, an action center is a great way to do that and to activate your family advocates and um, child care providers in your state. So oh, let us know and we're happy to work with you to get an action center. And we talk a lot about contacting your members of Congress and talking about national and federal policy. Um, but we also know that we, um, our local and state elected officials also need to hear from you in your networks. So we encourage you to contact your members of Congress and other elected officials. We have these really cute postcards um, that we'll be sending out in our emails 
Um, it's something you can print out, color, write a letter to your elected officials talking about the impact of cost of care on you, on um, your families, on child care providers, and send them directly to them. We're also excited about this as a way to engage newly elected officials post-election. So we will be doing a bit of a second prompt, second push um, in the new year so that you have a way to engage your elected officials right um, as, we, as they start their new legislative sessions. Um, and really getting them to commit uh, to a plan for childcare and asking them what they are going to do. We have a great social press kit, social media kit that our social media manager has created that has direct, you just click on it and you can instantly tweet or share on Facebook with beautiful graphics. Um, Jess also mentioned the customizable graphics. We encourage you to share state-specific information um, as well and because your audience is often in your own state, so they want to see what's happening at the local level. And on next Wednesday, we are having a Twitter storm at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, using our hashtag, hashtag childcare and us. We have a bunch of sample tweets and easy ways to tweet directly again from our social media kit and all these links will be in your inbox. I just want to add a note, if there are creative ways that you take action from this report um, at the state or local level, we'd love to hear it from you because we want to be able to share that on social media and also keep those in mind for next year because we're look, always looking for ways to help our members and other advocates take action from this report. Great, thanks Lauren. Um, so with that, we are just about out of time for today, but if you do have any questions, please um, enter them into the chat box. We might have time for about one question, but I also want to leave contact information for um, everyone at CCAOA up on the screen. Um, you can also, I think there are a couple of avenues through the website where you can reach out to us. Um, if you want to get a hold of the research team, an easy way to do that is research at usa.childcareware.org. Um, I did notice that I have a couple of emails in that inbox this morning, right. but I, been, well, I think we've been a little bit busy with the report, mm -hmm. so I will be following up um, if you are one of those folks. Um, it looks like we did get a question. Um, the question is, when will we receive our copy of the embargoed report, and then when will it go to the press? So the embargo copy will be released to members um, before the weekend. Um, it will be publicly launched um, along with um, all of those other things that we talked about today, the share kit, the county level supplements, the updated map, all of that on Monday, um, I believe Monday afternoon. Also, a quick and easy way to remember how to reach us is it's our first name, dot, last name, and all of our, you know, all of it after the at is the usa.childcareware.org. Oh, the question, uh, the follow-up question to that is, um, so will reporters have it ahead of time? They also often call for background prior to the release. I believe that there are a few reporters, I think they're mostly national level reporters that have in, uh, that are going to have embargoed copies that we've shared. Um, but I will, what we can do, and this is another name we probably should add to our PowerPoint, is um, Rayanne um, is our PR person who works directly with the press, and so we can connect you with, I think you, uh, this is Anne, probably, mm -hmm. who has connection with her anyway, mm -hmm. but we can let them, let her know that you have that question and let, let her know also if there's, um, if, there's, if you need to have conversations with her about specific parts of the report, mm -hmm. we can get that to you. Um, and I think what we're going to do um, in some of the emails that we send out, we are listing her name and her contact information because she is available to help you at the state level and at the local level with any PR and media requests, even to the point she said of doing media training to help you get ready to answer questions. Um, and on that note, just a quick follow-up from Adina, who is our awesome communications lead, that the public launch of the report will be Monday at 10 a.m. Um, Eastern Time, just as a, an FYI to folks. Um, and it, it looks like we are, um, we are out of time, so we are going to wrap up the webinar. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to anyone on our team if you have any questions, concerns. Um, let us know if you have questions as you read the, the report. Um, and thank you all for joining. Thank you all for you know being 
so active and you know for those of you who give us data um, very much appreciated um, on that thank you so much thank you bye bye